Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, amma ba'd, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Brothers and sisters, inshallah wa ta'ala, in this video today, we're going to be talking about the proofs and evidences for the two types of tawheed. And we're going to be showing that these two types of tawheed are actually different and they're not the same. Now, some of you might be thinking, hey, aren't there three types of tawheed? What about Allah's names and attributes? And I'm going to say to you, yes, that is the third type. But inshallah ta'ala, it's not going to be party to our discussion today. We're going to leave that for another day. But today we're going to talk about the first two types of Tawheed. Now before I mention what these types of Tawheed are, let's define what Tawheed means. Tawheed means to single Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means to make Allah azza wa jal one. Monotheism in other words. Now monotheism is of types. Singling Allah is of types, right? One type is when you single Allah azza wa jal in his lordship, in his rububiyyah. Rububiyyah means in his lordship. Now what, what, what does it mean to single Allah in his rububiyyah? It means to say that he's the only lord. Well, what, what, what does it mean to say he's the only lord? To he's, say he's the only lord alone? Well, you need to know a bit about what Rabb means. Rabb means he's the khaliq, he's the creator. It means he's the raziq, he's the provider. It means he's the mudabbir, the one who controls the creation, okay? It means he exists, he is actually in existence. So when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the only Lord, we're saying he's the only creator, only provider, only controller, and the only one, the only, on, 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 the, 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 the only one who's single in all of this. He's the only one in, in, in these affairs, and no one shares it with him. The moment you believe, wait, someone creates besides Allah, or someone provides besides Allah, or someone controls the affairs or elements within the universe or things that are only that there for Allah to control. Anytime you believe this, that someone else does this besides Allah, then you have left the fold of Islam. You didn't even come with Tawheed al rububiyyah Now it's important to know that the Kuffar of Quraysh, they never had a problem with this. They believed Allah was the only controller, provider, sustainer of affairs. They believed this. There are many evidences in the Quran. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you say to them, who is it that created you? Who is it that sends down risk from the sky? Who is it that brings the dead from the life, uh, the dead from the, the, the life and, 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 the, and, and life from the dead? فَسَيَقُولُونَ Allah. They will say it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many verses like this in Surah Yunus, Surah Al Mu'minun, and so on and so forth. That's Tawheed al Rububiyya. Tawheed al Uluhiyya, okay, is singling Allah as the only, the only being that you worship, okay? The only one that you're going to worship. For example, there are people who believe that there is only one creator, there's only one provider, okay? That's Tawheed in Rububiyyah. But they fall short in Tawheed al uluhiyah because knowing that Allah is the only creator and provider, they don't only worship Him. They worship Him and someone besides Him. The Christians, they worship Jesus. The grave worshippers, they worship the saints. Some of them worship the Prophet wasallam. Even the Hindus, they believe there is Brahman, who is the main Godhead, who is in charge of everything. And then all these other idols, they don't actually control um, everything the way that the main God who's in the center of the earth does it, Brahman. But they are all things that help you get closer to this one main God. And they are all representatives of Him. So, these people, they can, you can say that uh, they come with Tawheed al rububiyyah singling that there is only one God, provider, pro provider, creator, sustainer, but then they fall short in worshipping Him alone. The same way he's the only deity, the only Lord, we say he should be the only one that you worship. But when you worship someone else besides him, you have done shirk in ibadah. So we call this, sh sh we call this a defiance, a, 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 a nullification of the tawheed, of the oneness, of the monotheism, of uluhiya, of ibadah. The, the, the monotheism of worship. Now it's important that you have that you understand the following. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah 
It is a description of Allah and Allah's actions. This is important for you to understand. And Tawheed al uluhiyah it is a description of the slave and the slave's actions. So when you say I have Tawheed in Rububiyyah, you're saying I single Allah as the only Rabb, only creator, provider, sustainer. When you say I have Tawheed al uluhiyah you're saying I single my actions, my worship, my servitude, my ibadah only for Allah. Which means that if you now go to a grave of a saint and you make dua to the grave, and you make dua to the saint, you've done shirk. Because the Prophet said, and dua will ibadah. Dua is ibadah, so dua is worship, and it should only be for Allah. So then you have to go through the checklist of things. What is worship? Worship is this, 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 this. this. The moment you know, okay, okay, this is what worship is. Now that can only be for Allah. فَمَنْ صَرَفَ مِنْهَا شَيْئًا لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ If you take something that was for Allah with in, in ibadah, and you divert it from Allah to a prophet, to a saint, to a rock, an idol, a tree, whatever you might do it to, you now took that thing as a God besides Allah, you worship it, and you left the fold of Islam. Good. So now we have a brief introduction into Tawheed al-Uluhiyah and Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Before we talk about the proofs and evidences for these two being two types of Tawheed, you might ask, why do I even need to go into this? Why do I need to learn, you know, that, they're different, that, that, that there are proofs for them being different? It seems pretty straightforward. I mean, who would deny this, right? Well, there is a group of people who would deny it. There are the Sufis who worship the graves who would deny that the Tawheed is of two types. There are this, this new movement of, of, of people who are against the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab who are not necessarily Sufi in and within themselves, even though many of them are Sufis. And they have a problem with this da'wah of Tawheed. And because they have an issue with this da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, they try to say he was the one who invented these types of Tawheed. And it, or, 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 or they say Ibn Taymiyyah did it. Um, and this is a newly invented matter and it never existed before them. And they did this so that they could say, oh, this Muslim's a kafir, that Muslim's a kafir, this Muslim's a kafir. And bear in mind, even though this is not the scope of our discussion, uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was not a, you know, um, you know, bloodthirsty individual who was saying kafir, 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 kafir to people. In fact, he was not like that in any way, shape or form. But to, you know, talk about that is beyond the scope of this discussion. But these are the claims that the people make. Okay, so based on that, what do they do? They also take the side of the Sufis and they say that Tawheed is not of these two types. It's only of this one type. So they can join hand with the Sufis and they can work together with them in their evil and follow their desires. So that is the problem. Now you might say, well, what benefit comes to them from denying these two types of Tawheed? And I'll tell you what the benefit is. The benefit is that it allows them to do shirk. Because for them, they say there's no such thing as Tawheed al-Uluhiyah. There's only Tawheed al rubiyah Meaning the Prophets, they only came to teach people Worship Allah, he's the only, uh, sorry, uh, not to worship Allah, but the prophets only came to tell you that Allah exists. Allah is the only creator. Allah is the only provider. <coughs> All of the reason for which the Quran was sent down and the prophets were sent forth is why? Is to educate and teach the people that Allah is the Lord, not necessarily to worship him alone. So they say, look, if you take Tawheed al-Uluhiyah out of the prophet's message, and you say the Prophet's message was only Tawheed al rububiyyah And if I accept Allah as my only Lord, then that means the only time you can accuse me of shirk is if I believe that there is another Lord besides Allah. If I believe there's another creator besides Allah, another provider besides Allah, another controller of affairs. But, but if you now say to me, hey, no, the Prophets actually came to teach you worship Allah alone. They came to say don't associate partners in worship with Allah, don't do shirk then now straight away, even if you believe Allah is the only creator, but then you worship the Prophet ﷺ by making dua at his grave, we'll say you done shirk now. But for these people, they say, no, we're not even doing shirk. Shirk is only if you deny Tawheed al rububiyyah You know why? Because shirk for them comes down to a nullification of Tawheed. But Tawheed is only of one type. And we say, no, they can be shirk in Tawheed al rububiyyah and shirk in Tawheed al uluhiyah Because the Tawheed is of two types, so then the shirk can enter each one of these types of Tawheed. And so they can do their shirk and carry on justifying their shirk. They say, look, we're not even doing shirk because Uluhiyah doesn't even exist. You are only calling me, accusing me of doing shirk because I'm, because I'm making dua to the Prophet's grave. Why? Because you made this concept of Tawheed al-Uluhiyah. Uh, 
But I don't even believe it. For me, the only type of Tawheed is one type, and that's Tawheed al rububiya And as long as I do this and I don't believe that there is another, another controller besides uh, Allah, another provider, creator besides Allah, I'm okay. And I'm going to carry on making du'a to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to help me. And then, and then pay attention, they also add this on. They say, when I make du'a to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa understand, I'm not asking the Prophet for help directly. I believe the Prophet, independent of Allah, has no control or power. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi will help me with Allah's help. And we'll say, subhanAllah, and look, so they're saying, we affirm Allah is the ultimate controller. But we say, ya akhi al-aziz, in fact, I don't even know if I can call you Akhi because you're coming with shit. But I say to you, person, I, I, I call upon you to be, to be rational, uh, to use your sound rational, which is in line with the, with the text, uh, to use your sound reason, which is in line with the text. I ask you to just use a bit of common sense here. The Prophet sallallahu said, ad dua ibadah That dua is worship. So worship cannot be for anyone else but Allah. So even if you believe the Prophet ﷺ doesn't do this independently of Allah, you're still throwing worship in his direction. So now you're di diverting it from Allah to the Prophet, whether you believe he is independent or not. But ibadah is only for Allah. Who say, listen, you made this concept, this construct of Tawheed al uluhiya and that's the only reason you're trying to put me into this trap. There is only one type of Tawheed. So that was my introduction, inshallah ta'ala. Today, bi'ibnillahi ta'ala, I'm going to prove to you, brothers and sisters, from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, from the evidences, I'm going to prove to you from the language, I'm going to prove to you from the text, and from the unanimous consensus, the ijma' of the Muslims, uh, and from the statements of the scholars, inshallah ta'ala, those who came before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and, ibn, and even ibn Taymiyyah, that the Tawheed is of two types. It's of two types, inshallah ta'ala. So for you to say it's only one, is a lie. It is of two types. And inshallah ta'ala, if you do shirk in either of them, you will leave the fold of Islam. And it's important because there is a movement that is on the rise. It is surfacing. We can smell them from afar. We see them talking about it in the Arab lands. And things that happen in the Arab world usually spills over into the West in terms of da'wah. We can see it happening. We can see these people starting to speak. Those who have a problem with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's da'wah, they're starting to publicize these things, spread it. They do it. They're doing it right now. A lot of these people, these liberal, uh, you know, fake sheikhs as we like to call them, uh, in America and UK, they do it only in private gatherings, but we're on to you and we're ready for you. You thought we weren't prepared? We have the books. We've read them, alhamdulillah, and reading them still, and still studying. And in every corner that you stand on trying to prove uh, and spread your party, private or public, we'll be there, inshallah ta'ala, to clean the nonsense and the filth that you put out there. So, inshallah ta'ala, without any further ado, let's talk about the linguistic proof that Tawheed al rububiyyah and Uluhiyah are two different types of things. Well, inshallah ta'ala, this one is going to be a bit technical. I'm just warning you ahead of time, it's going to be a bit technical. And it's going to be the only technical thing that we're going to discuss <coughs> in our discussion today. It's going to be the only technical thing that we're going to discuss. Um, I'm going to explain it in a technical way first, because there are those who are a bit more um, advanced and a bit more savvy when it comes to the sciences of the religion. So I don't want to deprive you of of, 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 of being stimulated in terms of, you know, uh, knowledge inshallah ta'ala but then those of you who are not so academically advanced in the sciences of the religion I don't want you to get uh, nervous or anxious or overwhelmed please don't worry be patient let listen to me explain it technically then I will come back to you I will explain it to you in a very simplified way and then inshallah ta'ala we will draw the point home together okay but be patient don't leave be a bit patient with knowledge it is a bit hard you will, you will, you will, this will aid you. Even if you don't understand it today, the technical side of things, it will help you in the future, inshallah ta'ala, because you will need these sciences eventually. So you will hear these terms and it will make sense to you eventually in the future. But then even then I'm going to explain it to you in a simpler way, simplified way nonetheless. So let's go into the technical side quickly. Uh, well, this is actually simple because we're still starting off and, I'll, and then I'll become technical in a second. So the word Tawheed al rububiyya is based around Allah's name Rabb. Al-Rabb, okay, the Lord. And Tawheed al uluhiya is based around Allah's name, Ilah. Okay, Allah's name, Ilah. Now, they are arguing and saying, Rabb and Ilah mean the same thing. Okay, we're saying, no, it means two different things. We're saying, Rabb means Lord, the creator, provider, sustainer, controller. Ilah means the one that you worship. The one that you worship, okay? The one that you take as a God, as a deity. They're saying, no, it means the same thing. Ilah and Rabb mean the same thing. They both mean Rabb. 
they both have the meaning of Rabb, Rububiyya, they are only one. For them, Tawheed al uluhiyah doesn't exist, only Tawheed al rububiyah exists. We say, okay, no problem. Let's go into the language, inshallah ta'ala, and let's see if we can find a meaning for you. Or rather, does the language indicate that you're actually digging a deeper hole for yourself? Now here's where we're going to get just slightly technical for a second, and then we're going to come back. Rabb, okay, is an ismu fa'il, okay? Bima'na Rabb. Okay, what it means is that Rabb is a name, a noun that indicates a verb. It indicates a verb. It is a verbal noun. It indicates a meaning in it to show that this name describes what the person does. Okay, good. Ila is ala wazni fi'alun. Ala wazni fi'alun. بمعنى مفعول. Okay, <laughs> that was a bit technical. Now we've got the technical thing out of the way, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to go and explain what I just said in a simplified way, and then I'm going to draw the point home. I know even the technical brothers and sisters are like, okay, cool, I don't understand the point. Don't worry, the point is coming. But I don't want to lose our brothers and sisters who might not understand what I just said. I want to make sure that they understand it as well. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're following suit with regards to what we're saying and what we're talking about right now. So, what I just explained in a very technical way, brothers and sisters, is that Rabb in it, even though it's a noun, it has a meaning of a dua. It has a meaning of a dua. So Rabb means, Rabb means, Rabb means the one who does creation, the one who does providing, the one who does, the one who does controlling. Okay? In the in in the in, in Rabb, because it's an ismu fa'il. It has the meaning of a dua, the one who's doing this. Okay? Ilah, because it comes in the pattern of fi'al, 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 okay? Which is a pattern of an Arabic, uh, it is a sarfi pattern, a, a morph morphological pattern, okay? In it, in it, there is a meaning, which is maf'ul, which means something that something is being done to, a thing that something is being done to. For example, Rab, I told you, is the one that is doing something. Ila is the one who is not doing something, but something is being done to it. For example, I'll give you some more examples. And here we're going to get a little bit more technical, but then we're going to bring it back in a second. There are other words in the Arabic language that follow this pattern. Ila, for example, fi'alun, right? Imamun, for example. Imamun is one who mu'tamun bihi. He is the one who is followed. So imam is this, in the meaning of imam is what people are doing to him. They are following him. He stands, he leads the prayer, people are following him. Kitab, right? Book, right? It's in that same pattern. Fi'al, imam, kitab. You see the rhyme? The pattern, right? Kitab, yani, what it means is maktubun. It is something that has been written upon. A, a book is something that's been written upon. An imam is something that is being followed. So the word that follows that pattern is always describing that which is being done to it, not what the thing is doing. Okay? For example, firash, which is the thing that you lie upon. It has the meaning of mafush, the th what, is, what is being lied on top of, what you're lying on top of. So the bed is being lied upon. It is being lied upon by a person who's sleepy, tired, right? Resting. So, in other words, what we're saying here is ilah is describing what happens to Allah. Rabb is describing what Allah does. Now this is the point that we're going to drive home now. If you say that Rabb and Ilah mean the same thing, let's say for <coughs> argument's sake we say, okay, no problem. For argument's sake we'll say Rabb means uh, Rabb and Ilah mean the same thing. Mean the same thing, they have the same meaning. In terms of lordship, Rabb means create, provide, sustain, control. Ila means create, provide, sustain, control. No problem. For argument's sake, we'll give you that. But here's where it becomes difficult for you. Because the Rabb, and it's from Allah's names, it's in the Quran, it's in the Quran, it's in the Sunnah. Because it comes in the language as an ismu fa'il, as a dua, it is always going to be describing rubiya from the anger of Allah doing it. Ila. Because in the language, and the language has already been codified, we can't tamper with it. It's been there, it's, it's preserved from before the time of the Prophet This is not us making this up. Ila, because it comes 
على وزن فعال in the pattern of فعال with the meaning بمعنى مفعول with the meaning of مفعول the one that something is being done to if we say يلا has the same meaning as رب what we cannot escape is that here it cannot have the meaning of the doer it would have to have the meaning of the one it's being done to. So if you say Rabb means creator and Ila means Rabb means create and Ila means create, then Rabb would be the one who's doing the creation. Ila would be the one who's being created. And hence lies the problem. If you say Allah is Ila and it means the same as Rabb, you're saying Rabb describes Allah from the angle of him when he creates us. Ila describes Allah from the angle when he was created. And Allah wasn't created. Not just that, because Rabb has the meaning of sustainer, the one who provides. Rabb is when Allah provides, Ilah is when Allah is provided for. Rabb also has the meaning of controller, mudabbir, tadbir. So Rabb is when Allah controls, Ilah is when Allah is being controlled. And that takes you down an even deeper deeper, darker, even down a deeper, darker, dirtier, shirkier, filthier hole to say that. And that is not right. And of course, Rabb and Ila do not mean create. They do mean totally separate things. But I didn't want to go too deep into it from that angle. I just wanted to show you the absurdity of postulating that they mean the same thing. Because even if we do say they mean the same thing, it means it in two different ways. One which will necessitate kufr. If Ila meant Rabb, only, and it had that meaning as they say it, then it would necessitate kufr, which even the Sufis cannot get out of, or these ikhwanis who are against the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. So that's point number one. From the language we've established, they mean two different things. Let's go and check it from the angle of the text. Okay. Nothing's going to be technical like that anymore, inshallah. <coughs> In the Quran, it shows from many angles that ilah and rabb, they mean two different things. One angle, is from the angle of a principle which is either ijtama'a iftarqa wa idha iftarqa ijtama'a. And that is that when a word is used in the exact same context as another word in the same context, then they have to have two separate meanings. Because if you say that they don't have two separate meanings, it means that repetition is taking place. And repetition is actually a lack of eloquence. And a lack of eloquence is something that we cannot attribute to the Qur'an. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلَا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ رَبِّ الْفَلَقِ Sorry. قُلَا أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Allah said, رَبِّ النَّاسِ So, Rabb was used. مَلِكِ النَّاسِ Then Allah said, إِلَاهِ النَّاسِ إِلَاهِ was used. رَبْ and إِلَاه were used in the same context. In the same context. Now, if you say they mean the same thing, then what you're, what you're saying is that the Qur'an is being repetitive. And the Qur'an is repeating. And repetition is a problem. Because if I was to repeat and say, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, I've repeated. If you were to take away one of my don't do that, don't do that, and only communicate one of them or two of them, has any of the meaning been lost? No. None of the meaning has been lost. The meaning still remains intact. What you've just lost is a repetition that might indicate towards a particular emphasis, but the meaning is still present. So now, if we say that the Quran has repetition, so ilah and Rabb mean the same thing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just repeated it a couple uh, uh, verses later, then what we're saying is that it's just repetition. Repetition is not additional information. It doesn't have new meaning. It actually just repeats the meaning that's previously there. So if I was to now take that ayah out, ilah in nas, if I take that ayah out, then there's no meaning lost from the, from the surah. But then that would, that would mean that you can just chop and change verses and take them out because they just have, they don't have any additional meaning. And meaning is the, is, the, is the point at the end of the day, right? And then that would cause people to start playing around with the Quran, saying, oh, no, 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 no. If I take this out, I haven't lost the meaning. The meaning is still present. And they would take verses out. And that's what it would lead to. And it is actually an insult to the Quran to say the Quran is repetition because repetition is not eloquence. Balagha, the Quran has the highest form of it. So he doesn't need to repeat every time Allah mentions a word, every time he mentions a harf, there is a meaning, a benefit that can be taken from it. So when Allah mentioned another word, ilah, he didn't just mention it to repeat, rather he was subhanahu wa ta'ala giving a new meaning. So it's two different words. And the fact that they are both mentioned in the same context is proof of that. So that's one angle from the Quran that shows that they're two different. 
Another angle from the Quran that shows they're different is that there are times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word ilah and it is impossible, it is impossible that the word ilah carried the meaning of Rabb, meaning creator, provider, sustainer. It's impossible that it had that meaning. They try to say Rabb means ilah and ilah means Rabb. Okay, fine. But we'll give you examples of Allah using ilah in the Quran and it doesn't make any sense for the word ilah here to mean Rabb. Because we're saying ilah means deity. We're saying ilah means deity. Deity, the one who's worshipped. Not the one who's created, not the one who creates, the one who's worshipped, right? But if you say, hey, 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 ilah means Rabb then it has to carry the meaning of Rabb, creator, provider, sustainer. So let's give these examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Banu Israel, they said to Musa alayhisam, ija'al lana ilahan kama lahum aliha. They saw people worshipping other gods besides Allah, and they said to Musa, ija'al lana, make for us ilahan, an ilah, ilah, kama lahum, the way that they have aliha, God, ilah, uh, the way that they have ilahs, the way that they have gods. So they asked Musa to make for them an ilah. So we say this means they asked, for Musa to make for them another god to worship besides Allah, which is of course impermissible, right? It's not allowed, it's shirk. So they asked Musa alayhi salam, they said, make for us a god that we can worship besides Allah. They wanted something to worship. But if these people say, hey, Tawheed and, uh, sorry, if they say Rabb and Ilah means the same thing, then what we will say unto them is, okay, then what you're saying is that here, when they said Musa make for us an Ilah, they were saying make for us a creator. Musa make for us a creator the way that they have a creator. But this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. This is a qarina haliya and a qarina aqliya. It is something that shows you that ilah here cannot mean rabb from the situation and even the intellect shows this. Why? Because they were already created. Banu Israel were already in creation. So why would they be saying Musa make a creator for us the way that they have a creator? Those people they are already in creation, the same way Banu Israel are in creation. So if you have already been created, why would you ask for a creator to create you? <laughs> it does not make any sense. Another example is, Allah said, أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَلَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَى Have you not seen the one who took his desires as an ilah, the one who took his desires as a god? He worships his desires, he follows his desires, right? So these people, if they say, ilah means Rabb, then, then what it's implying is that Allah said, have you not seen the one who took his desires as a creator? Oh, that's stupid. No, one, no, no one's going to say you took your desires as a creator because what, did your desires create you? No one did that. They took their desires as a God because they, they, they followed their desires, they worshipped their desires, they obeyed their desires the way they were supposed to obey Allah. So then they, 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 their desires, their nafs, their, their hawa, their hawa, it became a God, an object of their worship. But no one said, that. it doesn't mean that, they, they, that their desires created themselves, they took their desires as a creator, one who created them. No. That's not the case at all. So then again, that's another evidence from the Quran that shows it's impossible to take that. And then we have the ijma' of the ulama. The ijma' of the ulama. Um, for example, the four imams of the madhahib, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ta'ala, Imam Malik, and all of the ayamat al salaf and all of the other ulama of sunnah, they all mention unanimously that if a non-Muslim comes to you and he says, La khaliqa illa Allah, لا خالق إلا الله. That there is no creator except for Allah. It is not enough for him to become a Muslim. Why? Because خالق or رب does not mean إله. What makes you become a Muslim is لا إله إلا الله. لا إله إلا الله. And إله has a meaning that's different to خالق and different to رب. So if he comes and says لا رازق إلا الله. لا مدبر إلا الله. لا رب إلا الله. Sorry, لا خالق إلا الله. لا مدبر إلا الله. لا رازق إلا الله. لا رب إلا الله. You will not become Muslim. This is a unanimous consensus. Unanimous consensus. Because he didn't come with لا إله إلا الله. And لا إله إلا الله is not asking you to come with توحيد الربوبية. It's asking you to come with توحيد الألوهية. And this is an إجماع. A unanimous consensus. Scholars never disagreed on this issue. Never disagreed on this issue. Does that make sense? And of course, this ijma has an ev this consensus itself has an evidence. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Umir tu an uqati la nasa hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah wa yuqim salah wa yutu zakah." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I was commanded to fight the people until they testify that there is no <coughs> ilah except for Allah, and they accept the Prophet sallallahu alaihi sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a messenger of Allah." And they establish the prayer and they give the zakat. فَإِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصَمُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ 
wa amwalum. If they do that, then they are their, their blood and their wealth become sacred from me. So again, that ijma has an evidence. And in terms of scholars who had previously mentioned this, because I gave you evidence from the language, from the text, and also from the ijma. Now I want to mention to you scholars who mentioned this taqsimat of tawheed, these, this categorization of tawheed to show you, it's not something that was invented by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. It is something that existed from before him. And people who are not from necessarily his camp and his inclination in everything, they also affirm this issue. For example, you have Imam Mullah, Mullah Ali Qari, or Mullah Ali Qari, who was explaining Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala's Fiqh al-Akbar, which is Imam Abu Hanifa's kitab on Aqeedah. In explaining that book, he mentioned in there, and he clarified in there, that this Tawheed is of two types. Also you have Fakhruddin al-Hindi rahimahullah ta'ala who mentioned that the Tawheed is of two types and he actually went as far as to say that to deny that the Tawheed is of two types he said to deny he said فَلِأَجْلِ ذَلِكَ تَنَوْعُ تَوْحِيدِ بِنَوْعَيْنِ he said the Tawheed it is of two types Tawheed al-Rububiyya wa Tawheed al-Uluhiyya and he mentioned this he said فَإِنْكَارُ هَذَا he said and to deny this is إِنْكَارُ الْحِسِ is to deny your senses to, to deny that the Tawheed is of two types is like you denying your seeing, your, your hearing, your touching, to deny your, your senses. And he mentioned this in his al haqqul Mubin. And also you have Imam Ibn, ba Ibn Batta rahimahullah ta'ala, who was an Imam min Ayyamati Salaf from the early generations, from the early, before Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, before Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. And he mentioned this in his Kitab al Ibanah. <clears throat> and he mentioned it there as well. And there are many others, but inshallah, I didn't want to make the discussion too long. I thought mentioning a few would show you that we've got, you know, a man who's explaining the aqidah of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and some of the people claim to be Hanafi and they don't affirm this categorization of Tawheed when their own scholars done so, explaining the books and the aqidah of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala himself to show you that they are not upon the aqidah of some of their own Imams. I mentioned it to you from an Imam min Ayyamat al Salaf from the, from the earliest generations, Ibn Bana, Ibn, Ibn Batta, uh, Ibn Batta ta in his Kitab al Ibana. To show you, it was not something that Muhammad ibn Abdul Abd Wahhab or Ibn Taymiyyah came up with, it was way before them. So, inshallah ta'ala, to conclude and summarize, the Tawheed is of two types. We proved it from the language, from the, from the, from the text, from the, from the consensus. We gave you scholars who said this. Anyone who affirms that Tawheed is of two types, then he has actually become safe and entered into Islam. Because it's important to know that the prophets never came to teach you Allah is one. Because Allah said, Afillah is there any doubt in Allah? No, there's no doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even Fir'aun who said, Ana Rabbukum ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us he really believes that what? No, he believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, 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 the Lord of the heavens and the earth. They all believe this. The Quraysh believed this. They never, prophets never came to teach them Allah exists, Allah created you. No, they all knew that. What prophets came to, to say to them is, there is not a deity for you that you should worship other than Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا We did, we, to every single nation, we sent forth a messenger, and his job was أَنِ اعْبُدُ اللَّهَ To teach people worship Allah alone, وَجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And stay away from worshipping false gods. So this is the point. So Tawheed al-Uluhiyya is really what the fight of the, of the Prophets was with their people. The reason why the Prophet ﷺ went to battle. The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Qur'an. The reason why nations were destroyed. It is the point. It is what will bring you into Islam. Without it, a person will not come to Islam. So it's important that you know this. And protect yourself from the fitna of these people who try to misguide people elsewhere and otherwise. Study Tawheed. Study Sunnah. Study Aqeedah. Study these things, brothers and sisters. Because it is what will take you to paradise. We'll take you to the hell fight if you don't know it. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hey guys, I really hope that you benefited from that video. Before you go, I want to ask you a really important question. Have you guys ever thought about studying Islam and seeking knowledge? If not, then I want you to reflect upon this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet said that seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every single Muslim. Of course, that doesn't mean you have to be a scholar, but you have to know the basics in order for you to be the best possible slave and worshipper of Allah that you can possibly be. So, we decided to provide a solution for this. 
You see, many people want to study, but they don't have the means or the resources to do so. So we set up an online institute called the Knowledge College where you can study Islam from the comfort of your own home. So if you want more information on the Knowledge College and you'd like to sign up, go to the link below, check out the website, and hopefully we'll see you on the other side. Assalamu